Ghost Coat Magazine welcomes in our old friend, Anas Grossman. How are you doing today, sir? Hello, I'm doing fine. Awesome. Very fine is better than bad. <laughs> yeah. So you have this fantastic new album to where the light retreats, this great uh, technical death metal record, basically. You know, it's uh, fantastic. You are very busy in a multitude of projects. You seem to always be putting something out, guesting on someone's record. I saw something a few months ago where you showed up on another record. You have your own bands. Why a solo album in 2021 for you? Uh, actually, I could have released it earlier if I wasn't so busy um, because I recorded the drums I think by the end of 2019 or something like that. And then I had to coordinate uh, all the guest musicians because, you know, I don't, uh, first of all, I don't play, um, I play guitar, but not that great. So um, it would take a lot of studio magic to make it sound good. And obviously I can do that, but it's, it's you know, monkey work. So I'm, you know, I'm not interested in that. I rather give it to people who can actually play it. So I called the guys in my band Alkaloid if they want to help me out. And they did. They did a great job. And but, you know, it took some time. And then I had, you know, different session jobs um, and studio jobs that I get paid for. And of course, uh, I have to do them because there's deadlines and everything. So um, I had to find some time on the side to to actually do the record. And then I had to block like a, a couple of weeks in my own studio to mix it and do the, you know, just handle the production and uh, finally finish it. So um, it took actually longer than it did, but um, yeah, somehow this uh, pandemic situation kind of played, you know, um, did me uh, in that regard at least. And that is maybe the only regard in that regard, it did me a, a little favor because um, I know it sucked that all the live shows got canceled, obviously, but then I could use the time to finish up the album and, and get it out and now uh, promote it a little bit and, and so on. Um, yeah, but uh, well, um, I always write songs and I don't, sometimes I don't really know what it's for. And there comes a certain time when I have a couple of songs written where a possible album shapes up. And um, the idea with my solo record was it started out to get rid of some of the songs I initially wrote for Obscura back when I was in the band and just to get rid of them. And, you know, um, but then, I mean, it's it's kind of a fun project for me to do that. Um, and it's it's not like b-sides or anything and but it's songs um that are definitely like death metal or tech death metal in what sense um and whatever you know these songs feel kind of easy for me they come easy for me so um i write them and then i don't really um work on on it a hundred hours or something i have a couple of ideas and then i finish it up pretty quickly and that's that and I'm having fun with it and that's the idea of the solo project not to overthink things even though it might sound very technical um, but for me it, it really isn't it's it's really something I can you know it's my total comfort zone and I don't have to leave the comfort zone I'm rather leaving the comfort zone when I work for other people or when I um, produce my band Alkaloid that's really out of my, out of the box but with my solo project, it's, you know, it's something I can really um, write um, whenever I have, you know, off time, basically. So nice. I like the sense of confidence. And I think what's really interesting about this is a lot of artists, uh, you know, they are very precious about what they put out, right? And uh, I love the sound that you don't need to be so careful about it. You're not so worrying about every single beat and every single measure. It's like, you know, these are, you know, songs, you've had them for a while. It's time to release them to the world. Here they are, you're not gonna overthink it, like you said. And uh, and conversely, I think some artists don't think carefully enough when they put out too much stuff, but you, but, you know, you do, produce such a volume of material. So it's really refreshing to hear that you have like the self-confidence to not worry too much. Yeah, let's put it this way. Um, I do delete stuff I'm, and I don't, you know, even stuff I worked on and sometimes I did demos or halfway finished the recordings 
sometimes I'm just throwing it away because I think, ah, it's not there yet. So I am picky with the, the stuff, of course, but um, there's a clear idea um, for these songs and what it should be and how it's going to shape up. So um, um, I'm, I'm doing it for a quite a long time. So it's, it's not really, um, I don't have to be insecure about the songs. Of course, um, with certain with certain ideas I am and with certain um, songs, they come easier than others. But I would say in general, you know, I've been writing and producing songs for such a long time that I really, well, don't need to um, to overthink things. If, if I have the feeling it's um, good enough for what I do or for what I want to express, then I, I guess um, nobody's going to say, oh, this is, you know, the, what, what was his thought here? <laughs> you know, I don't think that will be the reaction of people. And I don't worry about it too much. Maybe that's one of the key aspects that I, I you know, I, I cannot control who, who likes the stuff and, and to what extent um, fans will appreciate it that like the stuff I did before that I don't know. And honestly, I, you know, I cannot um, really focus on that because everybody has a different opinion about things it's interesting to know that and it's interesting to learn that when I speak with people who listen to my music and what they have to say I'm really interested in that but you know you cannot um, base your judgment about your own music um, on a possible reaction of people no it's not possible um, so and I, th I don't think it's helpful. So I don't do that. And once you don't do that, then the insecurity pretty much goes away because then it's only you who you have to please. And that's hard enough, I would say. It's so true, so true. That's great. And uh, that'll be a great lesson for everybody who gets to see this uh, interview. Uh, you typically give lessons over video or on your, you know, your series of video lessons and your books and stuff. So what a great philosophical lesson to give today. Um, greatly appreciated. Do you think that the year, sort of the pandemic year, uh, did you work more on projects either for yourself or others or about the same amount as you normally would? Um, well, I think, um, you know, compared to 2019, it's pretty much the same, maybe even a couple of mixes more than I, you know, I did a couple of album productions and a couple of mix mixing jobs and stuff like that um in regards of my own projects well this is the only you know my solo album is the only project that i have released now in um 220 like it's released now but um the main workload was done in 220 so um uh, i would say um well good question i don't know <laughs> stumped you um I, I you know what i i don't mean to uh, pause us but i think maybe you know what i think about with this record is that uh what, was there any material that you create beside the stuff you wanted to release i don't know if every one of those songs qualified as an older piece of work from obscura or just new stuff that you created with the guys for this record but i wonder if you had a, a moment you're like, maybe I should save this for Alkaloid or is did everything you created in this period of time last year was just for this release? No, actually, um, well, I wasn't really sure with a couple of songs. Um, uh, one of the songs is um, the fifth song on the album called Dao La Giri. Um, yeah, with the idea, it's, it's a very unusual idea because I um, it started with the drum beat with the drum intro and that's I just wrote the the guitar line on top of of the drum beat and I never do that I it when I write I always start with any melodic instrument like you know mostly a guitar um, and then I go from there and the drums are really more or less there to keep the parts together and orchestrated illustrated and um, shape the the you know velocity of the song but it's it's not so much a songwriting tool and it's different with uh, Dalagiri it actually two of the parts of the main parts were based on the drums I just wrote music on top of that and usually when I 
do things differently than I used to, to do, then it's a good sign that it might be an alkaloid song. Um, however, I thought, um, you know, it's been a while. I wrote the song in 2019 and I wanted to release it. And, and, and somehow there wasn't really a lot of room for, for contribution by other people. And that's also something with alkaloid, I leave a couple of things open to, for the other guys to interpret and to put in their own vision. Um, and with that song, it wasn't really possible anymore. Everything was like really clear and thought, you know, um, the notation was pretty much uh, done. Like there's not much room for anybody else to contribute. So I thought like, maybe it's, it's more of a solo song this time. And there's a second tune on the album um, called The Fountain uh, with Morian on vocals who also sings for Alkaloid. And I was thinking maybe that could be an Alkaloid song. Um, but there is a very melodic part in the, in, the, in the song where I was like, I don't know. I don't know how the other guys feel about it. Maybe not. Let's not ask them. <laughs> because I didn't, you know, maybe the danger is that somebody says, I don't know. Maybe skip that part. And I just didn't want to skip the part. So I thought like, hey, I need one more song anyway. So I just put it on the record. But th those are two songs that could have been Alkaloid. But then for an Alkaloid song, I would have I would have said maybe in terms of structure or what's going on in the song, it's, it's very much like, how can I put it? Um, traditional songwriting structure in some way. And with Alkaloid, we don't do that so much. So it's it's more or less like little things where I decided for myself, no, this is rather solo material. But yeah, depends. Also the instrumentation for most of the alkaloid stuff, there's a lot of different sounds going on. And um, as you can can hear, like my new record, it's in terms of sound, sonically, it's more a traditional death or tech death album with distorted electrical guitars, bass, and uh, yeah, drums, and not really any clean vocals or anything like that. So that's also something I rather put into my solo work. So it's it's kind of funny that I, I saved the very progressive stuff for my main band. And, you know, the, um, let's say, meat and potato stuff I do with my solo project. Usually it's the other way around with most musicians, but I don't know. It just developed that way. Might be different on the next one. I don't know yet. Right on. Actually, that's my favorite track on the record is The Fountain. And the vibe that I got from that song, I love that you said progressive. I really got a feeling like um, it reminded me of early At The Gates uh, okay. or even some of the more melodic stuff from The Haunted. So still your countryman, but, uh, you know, also, uh, you know, that genre, you know, sort of very mellow death, but also very progressive, too that I really dug and I love the writing on those and that track actually the album is very is strong all the way through but I love those last three tracks I probably listen to those to me the most cool yeah really strong ending um kind of uh pumped me up <laughs> right before we chatted yeah. I had them on I had them on repeat and uh yeah it's awesome um I love that uh, those choices and uh and I like the idea of not uh talking it over too much, just let people do what they do, right? As a sort of director yeah. musically of your own album. Uh, and yeah. I'm sure that's the same way you are as a producer, right? It probably lends itself to, uh, you know, kind of your, you know, production work, the same idea. Yeah, I would say with uh, album mixing and producing, um, you know, especially when other bands ask me to handle a mix, I would say it, it, it really, um, the, well, my approach is how does the band sound? How does this other artist sound? Do they have an own sound? What's the sound and how can I shape it up in a way that I feel it fits with the music? Um, you know, what never really works is when people um, have a, a stale idea of a sound they like and it doesn't really go together with what, what they write. Um, for instance, you mentioned At The Gates. Of course, it's a big influence on the metal scene and um, especially Slaughter of the Soul has a great sound, but it, you know, it fits the music. And when you go into the studio and, you, and people are, are like, hey, I want to sound like 
our album should sound like that, but they write completely different riffs and a different tuning and with, you know, different drumming and so on. It doesn't work anymore. So you, you cannot carbon copies a sound or a, you know, a feeling because feeling, you know, it's, it's, it's in the notes that you play and in the recording. So, um, it, it really depends. Um, when I only do mixes, most of the time people have recorded the stuff already and then I get to mix it, maybe reamp the guitars and stuff like that. But um, most of the sound choices are pretty much set or at least the performance is done. And then you can only work with the performance and see what is in the performance, what, what is the, um, the strength in the performance. What are the weaknesses if there are any weakness if there's a weakness which is it and how can i compensate it and these are different things and i would um rather keep it honest um and and try to to work what's there and not just put my own thing of you know on top of somebody else's music because i mean i put my own ideas in there anyways but i you know i don't think it's it's really beneficial for somebody else if i have a, like a sound that always sounds the same and people um go to my studio to have that ex same exact sound i mean if that would be the case great because then you know people know exactly what they get what i'm doing is much more complicated because i have to communicate it and and see if we're on the same page and it's really um you know a long process sometimes and and um it also can be very frustrating because i have an idea they have an idea and you come together and then eventually eventually and it works out but it takes some effort and and that's more my my approach to producing rather than you know have my go-to sound and that's what everybody gets nice um i've done quite a bit of these interviews over uh zoom in this period of time, and I, I love asking this question. Quite a few artists have mentioned to me, and uh, who you know, none as busy, quite as busy as you. But some of them have said that even despite the constant work, they took the opportunity when they had some extra time to tweak their gear, to look at new approaches to their kit or their setup if they're a guitar player or bassist. So I was going to ask the same thing of you. Did you take any time during this period of time in the middle of all these projects that are? constantly uh, going on for you? Did you adjust your kit at all? Did you take new approaches to just producing or recording gear? Anything like that to incorporate uh, during this period of time? Actually, I changed my studio rooms. I moved into a bigger room, um, better uh, recording room. And uh, yeah, I invested a little bit into um, studio stuff, I would say, like studio equipment and gear a uh, couple of what yeah more like um working on room room sounds like absorbers and stuff like that um with my drums not really um no i wouldn't okay. say i would no it's i mean i i know after all these years i i just know my my you know how i move around on the drum kit and uh what's the best way to set it up so i really don't change that too much because um it might you know not be beneficial uh, i've did some experimentation with i just put switch on a light because it might get a little dark um i did a couple of experimentation in the last years playing with different bands i used to have a different um setup with hate eternal um only two rack toms two floor toms and I went back to the three rack toms that I used with Obscura. And I don't know, it's, um, I don't know, I pretty much changed, changed it back to the way it was a couple of years ago. Um, and then maybe fine tune that general idea that I have of a drum set. Um, but no, I didn't really adjust anything on my instrument because I really know what I want and where I want it. So nice. Um, I, I find uh, a lot of drummers that I've been talking to lately uh, who've been around quite a while 
um, veterans, if you will, of the scene. Uh, I feel I feel like uh, maybe there's a trend, at least not scientifically here, but there's a trend that I'm noticing personally where I'm seeing uh, drummers going to smaller and lesser kits over time, as opposed to, you know, obviously when you're younger and you can carry more gear to a show and have every possible, you know, let's have 20 Chinas, I don't care. And, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I see kits getting smaller and smaller. I love uh, Michelle Away. Uh, from uh, Boivod, and he is playing a progressively smaller kit as he gets older. That may be personal, uh, personal choice, but I always admire him, and I think about those choices. So I wonder uh, if maybe you're also that's happening to you too. Like, mm. oh, maybe less is more. Yeah, it, it it depends. I think <clears throat> it's two things why that happens with people. One positive. One thing is I know how to. Um, write certain drumlines with less gear so they're um, actually focusing on what they exactly need which um, is a positive um, development the other thing would be laziness <laughs> because of course i mean if you have less gear you have less to pack you have less to build up uh, less to you know put microphones on it's also cheaper and all of that so <laughs> i don't know um since my kids stay st stayed the same for like well almost 10 years i would say i i changed small details but not not the big picture so um i did that when i was in my early 20s i always had the question what do i really need to play what i write sometimes i would add stuff like with alkaloid i have these two little octobuns that I play. Um, sometimes I cannot bring them when we when we play live. I cannot bring them with me uh, in the plane or whatever. It doesn't make sense to bring them. So I just play something else, but I still would like to have them on the album um, as an additional sound source. Lately, I've been thinking about maybe adding a, a few splashes, a few small symbols. But you know, it's really details, but I I really thought about what I really need to orchestrate my music. And it's not less stuff. Also with one versus two kick drums, one kick drum makes things so much easier. But then again, um, I don't know. Um, I'm used to playing two kick drums. It's a more, it's a more even sound for me because uh, the beater always hits in the center of each drum. Um, it's easier in the pre-production um, because you don't have a lot of super fast strokes on one track. And then you maybe want to add a sample or a trigger or something to, you know, outline the original, like the acoustic sound of the drum kit. And, you know, the trigger doesn't really get all the strokes and it it's, becomes a nightmare. So with two bass drums, that, that doesn't happen at all because it's, when you're playing like you know, it's just ta 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 for one kick drum. And it's really easy um, for the software to recognize these hits. And, you know, these are more practical things. So, you know, I, I'm also doing that for, you know, laziness, but, or convenience. I would say convenience uh, reasons to have two kick drums. But um, yeah, when I play live, I have to bring them or somebody else has to bring it they have to be there because i don't even own a double pedal anymore so you know i'm, I'm not going back either way nice um, good advice for everybody on the uh, double pedal journey of their life maybe the single is better for you try them all uh try them all out um so yeah i just have a few more for you man i, I love talking to you i could talk drum stuff all day i don't get to talk to enough about drums and drumming and drummers but um you know, obviously, uh, the last year with no touring, uh, I'm sure you didn't get to tour as much as you would have liked behind the last Alkaloid album. Uh, what's the plan for shows and festivals coming back? Are you guys going to take the old album back out on the road? Are you writing a new album to put out and then tour behind that? What is, if you can talk about it, what's the plan? Yeah, no, we're, we're actually um, in the songwriting process and, it, and it's approaching the finish line. Like we're not finished, but it's, getting closer i would say um i would say in um latest in fall or maybe even summer i could start recording and 
then we can put out a new record. Um, the other rec the last record, we didn't really tour on that record that much, has different reasons. One, the main reason is um, financial reasons, to be honest. Um, we had some opportunities to tour, and then we did the calculation. And um, actually, I mean, we are all in our at least in our 30s or late 30s, you know. And, um, you know, it's not like in your early 20s where you can hit the road and you don't care because you're living in, you know, in your mom's basement, basically. No, it's not happening anymore. And we have to pay bills. And um, it's not a particularly huge band, you know. So we would do um, support tours for underground tech death stuff, something like that. And, um, you know, how many people show up to these shows? Well, maybe 100, maybe 50, maybe 150, I don't know. But when playing a festival, um, we can play for thousands of people with just one show and also reach new audience on this tech death tours, only our own our audience that knows us already will come, which is great. And we definitely want to play for these guys in the future. But now um, with the last album, it just, you know, the numbers were just not matching our expectations. So we thought like, okay, we really have to invest money to go on the road to make it happen to the standards that we require. Um, and then if you make an investment then it should be something that creates a return even though we love to play and we would love to go out on the road but um on the last album like um you know there's not a lot of money in touring people don't really understand that with uh death metal i mean this you, you it gets paid shit and <laughs> you know um that's just the reality of things and when i go out for weeks i have to make sure that i uh, get you know that I earn money to pay my bills and if that's not happening then yeah I can't do it I mean if you know, if uh unless you don't want the the ticket sold to be like a hundred bucks um then the, I don't see any way um how this changes but um with a new album um if that's received well and everything and we can make it we can um go on the road and play a tour for for a band that draws an audience as a direct support or a support band or whatever then i think it makes a lot of sense for us to go out and even if we don't make money it would be worth the investment because the return you get from touring is great then but there's no point it's, it's a waste of time money and energy if you play an underground tour and play for 50 people it's not worth it these days you can rather spend the money on you know you rent out a big studio you film it you mix it you put it on youtube potentially millions can see that and you know that's because after all concerts are promotion for a tour we're not in the situation where we can make a living going on the road so when that's not the case and maybe we'll we'll get there someday but we're not there yet so and we're not the type of guys who uh we're very strategic about our efforts what we do and um we go for organic growth uh, like slow change slow growth um we also write music for people who are really into music not so much you know uh, what might be popular or anything like that, which is, you know, it, it's it's not meant to be a commercial thing. And the only way we can have commercial success is by building it up from the ground slowly. Um, but, you know, I've made, we all made this um, mistake where we went on the road like uh, half a year or something like that. And if you then look at the sales, it didn't really matter if you go one month or six months. You know, this is um, a waste of energy and it really burns you out as a musician because we're making music and then you make an album, that's what you want to do. And then you want to play for people and it becomes this frustrating 
cycle where you have to go out and you have to do this and but why <laughs> now you can promote it much easy much more easy and you can bring music in into people's living rooms like live and um but to make a long story short um i think we definitely um have um have to play live more because I, I would say once, um, yeah, there are a couple of videos that I've seen where we performed live and I, and we're, we are good, you know, it, Alkaloid has, has good musicians in the band and we're a good live band. And it's really, um, yeah, we should show that more to people. And um, we definitely have to make up for not going on the road with our last album too much. Um, so well, when we, after we put out this new record, nobody can say uh, what will happen in 2022, because um, as I understand it now, um, all the, the shows that are on hold because of the pandemic, they happen in 2022. So, um, you know, we'll have to be flexible. We definitely want to do more and um, play tours, play more shows, play more festivals, all of that, yes. Amazing, I hope so. Um, just for a final thought, I, I really appreciate your answers and your time. You have been part of so many great bands. You, you know, uh, Alkaloid is fantastic, Obscure, people know you from, of course, I'm sure every interviewer asks you about Necrophagist and Blotted Science, but I wanted to talk about your incredible, uh, uh, concert you did with Thomas G. Warrior for Trypticon, the Requiem show yeah. at Roadburn. Uh, I had the privilege to interview Tom last year, and he said it was his honor to play with you. And okay. uh, he was really just, uh, first, of all, first of all, I love that whole, you know, huge Celtic Cross fan and a huge Trypticon fan. So uh, it was fantastic to chat with him about that album and that you know, Requiem and in general, the whole arc of that. But he really, that performance was unbelievable. I have attended Roadburn, not that one, we covered it, but I wasn't there this time around. But uh, I watched the filming of it. It seemed really like a, a completely new environment. I'm sure, you know, it's uh, probably rare for you to have played with such a, a great orchestra and then singers and this you know, particular piece of music. But I just wanted to get your feelings on that project because uh, I'm sure you haven't been asked a lot about it. Um. <laughs> Yeah, it was a great experience, actually, playing with an orchestra. Um, I have to say it went pretty smooth um, from my perspective, because um, all I had to do pretty much was to play the, the piece. And um, how can I put this? Um, most of the stuff was composed already. Like, it's, it's a written piece. And the drum line was more or less composed. And it's not super complex. So I had my note sheets there and I could just play what's on the note sheets and not really think there was also a click track to get in sync with the orchestra and all of that to make sure it's really locked in. And it's, it's like playing on autopilot. You have your notation and you know, your uh, click track. And then I just, um, yeah, it, it went re for me that stuff, then this kind of situation is really easy because you know, I don't lead, I just follow the, the conductor and what's on the note sheet and I follow the click track. So it's really playing on autopilot and I could actually really um, take a look around and, you know, look at the art, you know, experience the whole thing. Most of the time with, with the music, with the live shows, I'm so consumed by my parts because it's diff uh, so difficult um, that I cannot really listen to the whole thing. But, um, this was a great um, environment. Also, um, I've never played with an orchestra before and uh, the or Metropole Orchestra from, from Holland, I mean, they're a great orchestra. They also have a lot of uh, experience playing with, um, let's say, non-classical um, artists. So, um, yeah, it, it, from my perspective, it really went smooth. I had nothing to organize. It just had to be there and play my parts right. And, you know, I had a lot of time to pre prepare and then we did the rehearsals and it was all nice in this ni very nice uh, rehearsal room. Um, you know, big classical music environment. It was like a top-notch studio. 
And, you know, um, I wasn't under, you know, huge amount of stress. I think with Tom, it was diff different. I think he felt a lot of stress with the project because he's the main songwriter and, um, you know, and um, had a lot to organize. And I think he felt a lot. And I think he was once um, this was done, it was, you have to say, it was pretty big success. I think that was a big relief on his end. I had no doubts from the start that it's going to be great. But, um, you know, and it, and it was uh, also like, um, we played first band in the afternoon, which is weird, but because of the orchestra. So the, the headliner spot we actually had, um, we moved to, you know, first spot. I was like, okay, weird. We played at four in the afternoon, but, um, you know, it was totally packed. I, I think it was three or 4,000 people in, mm. in like they're completely packed. And um, they all were super quiet, like in these orchestral pieces where it's just drums and a violin and stuff. You, you know, it, nobody moved. Everybody was watching and listening. And this was a great experience um, because it, it is a serious composition. It's serious music. And um, I have to say, um, it's, you cannot take it for granted that people really listen to a piece of art, that it's 45 minutes, just a piece. And it's gonna be, form, be, gonna be performed once and that's it. So it's not, um, it's a very special thing we did. And I have also, um, with, which I liked is also uh, Morian uh, did the, um, uh, uh, the classical um, transcriptions and um, orchestral arrangements. So, there is a little bit, I wouldn't say of alkaloid because it's not alkaloid, but of his style and his work and his arrangement work is also in there, which to me is of course really familiar. So, you know, this is, I have to say uh, in 2019, that was by far like the best project I did or like the best thing and um and yeah i would even say it's it's definitely one of the top five concerts i, I played i have to say uh at least in my personal according to my personal favorites um and i have to say um it's also um for me it, it feels also good playing with tripticon because um uh, i'm you know I'm, I'm not a session guy i'm a i'm a band member and that makes a difference the way you look at it, the importance you put into that line of work is, is different. It feels different. Um, not saying that I don't enjoy any of, of, of the session work or that kind of stuff. Uh, of course, I take everything I do extremely seriously, but um, being part of, of a band is always something. I, I always wanted to be a band musician. I never, even though we're talking about my solo record today, and I put out solo records and it's, it's more a fun project. What I said earlier, I'm not really a solo guy. I'm not really a, a drum clinic guy either. I always wanted to play with bands in a lineup, you know, like rock, like the rock bands I was interested in. I'm still interested in bands and stuff like that. That's my thing, you know, listening to records. And that's why I, I, I became a studio guy as well, because I wanted to produce more records. And um, and uh, with Tripticon, that's a, a big part of, of that for me. So I, I, yeah, I'm really happy to play with them. And that um, um, Requiem was really a highlight, I would say. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, I'm, so, I'm so happy for you. And I love, I highly recommend anybody to go buy that album and go buy that DVD, Blu-ray, whatever you want to watch it on. It is amazing. And congrats to you on that. Uh, to Where the Light Retreats is your brand new solo album. It's out now. Hopefully people can buy the album and your incredible t-shirt with your name on it and a death metal logo yeah. on your website, um, which we'll link yeah. everything in the description. And uh, again, it's just been a great privilege to see you again and chat with you again about everything. Thanks so much for hanging out with Ghost Cole, Hannes Grossman. Oh, sure. Thank you for the time.